Hello and welcome to Epiphytic Cacti. Today we're gonna do a show and tell. I think we're gonna start with the terrarium here and there are some really interesting updates. For one, I do actually wanna show, I don't know if we can see that, but the general temperature in there right now is 72 degrees and the humidity is 95%. This thing, guys, is so humid all the time. But it seems like with the fans and everything, it's okay. When I very first saw the humidity, and for a long time, the humidity was like 99, 98%. And I was a little bit worried because I was like, the plants are gonna just rot, but they really didn't. Did wanna take a look here at Hediora Herminiae. <laughs> Who knows if I said that right, but eek. So this is one of the ones that came from Andy's orchids and it had buds on it. And I just really wanted to show the flower. I think the very first flower that I ever saw of this was actually quite small. And so I'm surprised at kind of how large the flowers are. <laughs> just a few days of being in this terrarium. Here are these roots. Now I am having so much fun watching all of the plants grow roots in the terrarium. It's just really crazy, but especially the epiphytic cacti. When we think of epiphytic plants, a lot of times we're thinking about like your aeroids and your um, orchids. And a lot of times they have like those great big aerial roots that they'll produce. And epiphytic cacti have a really tiny, fine root. I mean, look at the little root just shooting up there. There's even one like way down in there doing something. So it's just really kind of fabulous to see. I absolutely love it. I think I shared them in a video before, but you could actually just get like a big cloche and maybe kind of hang one inside of a cloche and grow it that way. If you if you find that they're kind of, um, you're struggling with some of them, like Hattiora Herminiae is one that I definitely have struggled a lot with. I think most growers do. Here we can see all of the all of these roots that are forming and this guy right here because it's closer to the fans its pocket gets dry way faster and so I don't know if that's the best place for that one I think that when we go over here and we look at the other one this doesn't get so dry so fast and I know it's really surprising because with the humidity level of like 95 percent how do they get dry I'm wondering that myself, to be honest. I figured here we could look at, see the roots that are coming out. So you can see these roots that are coming out. There's some coming out on the back and these are coming out on this uh, Ripsalis Lindbergiana. And what's so cool is that you can see the feeder roots, the little tiny fine roots there that are actually just forming in the air. They would definitely be behaving that way in nature, producing those kinds of roots and getting nutrients and stuff out of the air. Of course, they do have the roots that are inside of the pockets of the trees sometimes or along climbing on the trees, but it just gives you kind of an idea. This guy is Ripsalis aurea, and Ripsalis aurea was having some problems. It was kind of um, rotting at the base there. And so I took these and I put them back in there and it looks like one of these is doing this. These two over here are actually doing okay. The one in the back is rotting again, but it has all those little aerial roots that you can see. So it's obviously some of it is alive, which is a good thing. I think if we go down here to my nemesis, <laughs> this plant that I have struggled so much with, which I find really surprising because if that mysterious Ripsalis that came from Andy's orchids actually ends up being Ripsalis jungeri. I have no idea why this has given me so many problems, but it is hydrated. You can see it still has all those like incredible aerial roots and tons have like little, um, the ends are starting to grow again on the aerial roots because now it's in a really humid environment. So that's kind of crazy, but it is hydrated. It's no longer all desiccated and everything. So it seems to like it in here. I can see the roots. I, I only see roots on the outside. Like I actually can't. I, I assume that there are roots that it has produced in its little pocket that I put here. So 
This guy, which we don't know what it is, has obviously hydrated. He was very wrinkly before and he's he is nice and hydrated now. This has been really cool too, to just see like the rip production here. So if we look at our bradii here, our Schlumbergera lutea subspecies bradii, so we can see that it's doing well, it's growing. I can see roots have spread from this. On the other one there, you can see that there are roots that have formed and are grabbing on to the little log that we tried to mount it on. So it seems to be doing well. Pieces of it definitely fell off and died. This seedling, this it's a Dysocactus. I don't remember if it's Quizelticus or if it's Dysocactus nelsonii. It's one of the two. It has actually started producing a adult branch instead of the seedling growth here. And there's two of them that it's trying to produce. So that was really interesting that I was like, wow, that was really fast. Here, I think the last time that we looked at this, this guy was looking very desiccated. And it looks like now he's producing roots and he's getting more hydrated. And that's Rupsalis campos potoana. And you can see right there, there is a root that's coming out, that's forming and coming out there. And there are some roots that I can see on the back and stuff coming out too. A lot of them actually. <laughs> there's there's tons of roots back there. I don't know. I don't think we can actually angle that way. But there's a bunch of long roots that are coming out of the back. So this has just been so interesting and fascinating to see. And I wanted to share that as part of the show and tell today. It's just doing really well. I'm super excited about it still. We've looked at this plant so much and it keeps making appearances in the show and tell because it keeps doing amazing things. Obviously we can see that there are buds that are forming there. They've been forming for a while. They just came out of nowhere. It was absolutely crazy. So this is Webero serious tunella subspecies biolii. And I mean, look at how fast it grows. We've looked at it so many times and it's just like, how, how is this growing so fast? I don't know if it's the cabinets, the humidity, the warmth. I have absolutely no idea, but the cabinets, these cabinet humidity levels, like this one is probably hovers around maybe 70, sometimes 80, but sometimes it goes down to 62, but I try to keep it above that. And then the temperature in here, I think, fluctuates. Um, I would guess that it's probably down to about 70, and it looks like it's gotten all the way up to 86. So it's definitely a warm, humid environment that it is in. And it had just, it was growing, and once these branches matured, it just immediately looks like at every single aerial, it produced kind of like a pre-bud. So it, it looks like it had the ability that it could have produced flowers out of every single aerial. And what it might do is it might actually flower like this. And then after these flower and they die, it might try to produce more flowers out of, you know, as time goes on out of those. I'm not exactly sure because I've never seen this one grow, but I just, it's so freaking cool. <laughs> I mean, just how did it, how? <laughs> I can see on this branch down here too, the exact same thing is going on. So on this branch, I can see that, I don't know if we can get this in focus just because of how weird it is. There we go. So there's just these little like pre-buds at the aerials. And it just happened as soon as the branch kind of matured, which is really unusual for a lot of epiphytic cacti. That's not a normal behavior that I see in most of them. I'm sure other ones do do this, but a lot of times on most epiphytic cacti, a branch has to mature and then be mature for kind of a, a while, like harden off is the term that people use for it. And it's usually like the branch will start to get kind of stiffer. And normally they wait for that. But here it was like, as soon as these reached a certain length, they just were like, bam, I'm mature now. I moved this into this cabinet to give it more room to grow. 
But, uh, you know, it immediately just started hitting the glass. <laughs> but that's okay because it, it hit the glass and it just keeps growing, which is really fantastic. I do want to give a tiny shout out to these two. So here we can see there's the original cutting for Weberosirius uh, tunilla and that one subspecies tunilla. And then we can see the first branch that it produced. I don't know if that's really done. It still looks like it's trying to grow out of the tip. And then you can see here there's a second branch that's coming. And my little slow poke. <laughs> so this one is Weberosirius trichophorus. And that is how much this branch has grown since the last time that we've looked at this. And it just is... It's fabulous. I just love it. I just love all all of them. They're so wonderful. One of the things that I absolutely love about Weberosirius, just the entire genus, is how the buds look. They always look like they're plastic. They don't even look real. It's crazy. And these are no exception. They look like little plastic buds. From the looks of it, <laughs> These flowers are going to be smaller than the Weberosirius frondingiorum and the Weberosirius bradii flowers. I could be wrong. It is a little bit surprising to see a flower this size come out of a little tiny, like, skinny branch like that. But I don't know. We'll just have to see how big those flowers get. They do not look like they're that far away from blooming to me. So I have to keep a very close eye on them, but I will definitely do a video highlighting featuring that when they do flower. FYI, I had mentioned my friends before, and one thing that I forgot to say in that video afterwards is that my friends bloomed. So my friends that, you know, we got him around the same time, he got his a little bit earlier, his bloomed, and then shortly afterwards, here is mine that's blooming. So it's not, it's not like a fluke or anything. It just, both of us had a wonderful experience with this growing just absolutely beautifully. And then both of us had the experience of it producing flowers just super fast. We are going to look at Strophocactus woodii just for a second here, but I thought this was kind of funny. So in my setup, I have these little things here that I water so that I can water my little moss wall for that. I just thought I would point that out because it was kind of funny. The growth rate on this seems slow to me, but then again, I look at it every day, so it probably just seems really slow to me. You can see how big that clade is getting right there and kind of how it's growing, I think is really interesting. So it, it almost looks like it made a humidity dome <laughs> for the backside of the clade. There, we moved down so we can see it properly. It was a good thing, I think, that I chose to extend this as quickly as I did because I, I was like, I don't know how big that's going to get. I don't know if that's enough room. And clearly, it was always going to need more room. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing growing on this side yet. I thought some of these had activated. I don't know if they did and they're just kind of hanging out waiting but you can see the little clay that's underneath there how much that has grown it's a little bit dry you need some water the moss oh yeah that's crunchy it definitely dries out faster than you think what's behind here doesn't dry out quite as fast though but the new stuff that i put on tends to dry out pretty quickly so that definitely needs some water so we're just gonna pop into this cabinet and I can't really pull that out. That's always so difficult. I want to pull it out, but I'm like, mm, I can't really pull that out. <laughs> I think it's so attractive, all of these little berries that are on this Ripsalis bassifera subspecies Marishiana. It's just really, really attractive. They're, and they're all different stages and they're kind of all different colors. And you can see that these guys see these clusters. You can see that whenever they ripen, they're kind of a whitish green color. I think I'm just going to pull it out. <laughs> One of the downsides is like trying to get things out without damaging other things <laughs> or damaging itself. Oh my goodness, it's so tangled. 
So you can see what this guy looks like. You can see it's kind of crazy town growth up here. And so this is one of the ones that would be very, very commonly confused with Ripsalis terris form heteroclata. But the berries on these, as opposed to heteroclata, tend to have like a teardropped kind of shape. Now, there's also some crazy things that I have recently found about this when I was, I don't remember what I was researching, but this species appears to be able to produce many different colored berries. So I thought that that was interesting. So here, I really think these berries are highly attractive, but I do just want to make the note that I've seen pictures where these berries could be red, pink, white, green, all different kinds of colors for this specific species. Look at all those beautiful berries. But also when it flowers, you can see that here, it has flower buds that are forming. And it doesn't really, mine doesn't do this thing where it like produces a huge flush of flowers. It actually just sort of continuously flowers and then produces these berries. And I love the way that the berries are in these little clusters like this. And this is one of those things where, again, it's a very underrated species just because most people think, you know, well, Bassifera, some people don't like them because they grow so quickly. I would say that with Bassifera, the flowers can be really attractive. It's, but this one has beautiful flowers. And there's another one that I have that the way that you see it is Ripsalis Bassifera subspecies Marishiana, and then you see single quotes in Ferrari. And so that is just trying to say that it's a cultivar, as in like someone cultivated that. That's what it's trying to say. Whether that is true or not, I don't really know. That specific one that you can buy quite readily has gorgeous flowers. Gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. I just kind of wanted to highlight how attractive that species can be. What are you doing? You cannot eat my berries. All right, there you can see. I mean, it very strongly resembles Ripsalis terris for sure. It's not Ripsalis terris, it just has a strong resemblance. I actually think that I got this plant under the name Ripsalis terris. There we go. You can see my Ripsalis terris form heteroclata there it has some flowers on it. Mine just seems to kind of do weird stuff where it produces flowers just whenever. <laughs> it, it definitely has a time that it blooms more readily, for sure, like outside in the spring, summer, more like summer here. It definitely has like a big flush of flowers, but it also just inside produces them sometimes just whenever. And so there you can see those little pretty flowers. They're always really attractive. It's always really, 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 really attractive. If we look at them like side by side like that, you can see the strong resemblance between the two and how it might be very difficult to tell these two apart <laughs> if they didn't have flowers and if they didn't have berries which is not surprising because they are very closely related. A really good example of a plant that should have been repotted ages ago. Look at how crazy that is. So this one is definitely a terrace. It looks to me, I guess it, you know, I guess this is just a terrace. I have no idea where this plant came from. Interesting. It's a really attractive terrace, though. I think I thought that maybe this was uh, terrace form prismatica, but now that I'm looking at this, I'm not really seeing that. And I'm not really sure where it came from, which you can see, see all of those roots busting out of there. Like I said, luckily with the uh, cabinets, this guy can sort of stay in there and grow like that. But... Look at that. Wee. <laughs> That's just cute. Um, but obviously this guy really needs to be repotted at some point. You can see there are some flowers that are spent there. 
And one of the ways, of course, that we know that it is Cheres is because the flowers as they died turned a bright yellow. There is so much variation. I say this all the time, but it's worth repeating a lot. There is so much variation in Ripsalis Terras, and they only called out the forms that were very identifiable. And so you have all kinds of plants. They're Ripsalis Terras, but they just don't quite fit the forms. And so here you can see there's a little tiny flower. There is a little tiny flower there. It has really attractive flowers and the flowers definitely look like, I mean, they're definitely little Terra's flowers, but really just kind of a mess of a plant and kind of a cutie too. <laughs> look at that. I mean, it's kind of a crazy thing that a Ripsalis can actually grow to this size in such a tiny pot, but look at all of the roots in the bottom there. That all of these things are like massive signs. This needs to be repotted. All right, so I didn't know if we could get up here, but we can. So this right here is a great big Ripsalis terrace form heteroclata. And you can see that it has tons of new growth. There's lots of sugar secretions going on. And again, here you can see, I cannot quite get in there, but you can see just kind of random flowers that are coming out there. And there's some other little random buds. Hard to see because he's like tucked away back in there. And then once again, my great big crazy Ripsalis Terra's form prismatica here. You can see once again, this bloomed like this in the fall when it came in and it actually hasn't stopped blooming all winter, but it obviously had like a large flush of blooms in the fall when it came in. And now again, it seems as though it's having another large flush of blooms. Whoop. Here we can see all of the buds and some of the blooms that are spent. And there is a ladybug on there. And I actually just wanted to show a couple of adorable things in here. So... Look at how much this thing is growing, this crazy grafted thing. I keep showing it because I think I'm so shocked at how much it's growing. This, this one specifically being grafted and in a cabinet just seems to be really taking off. Ripsalis dismillis form epiphyllanthoides. It's really, really, really catching my eye all the time. It's super fun to watch. Here is our crazy Mysterialis that seems most likely to be Ripsalis jungeri from Andy's orchids based off of the berry. I'm still not entirely sure, but I mean, based off of the berry, that seems the most obvious thing. But I just wanted to show what happened to that. The tiny little growth that was coming out of the end is now like this kind of mess. And there's a whole bunch of little tiny branches that are now coming off of those long branches. Let me actually try to pull it out. I kind of hate pulling them out, out of the cabinets just because with the new growth is always so fragile. And so there at the base, you can see that it's producing some more of those long basal branches. I don't know why this one specifically is so much more red than the other ones. It is, it's more red than the other ones that I got. It must have just been in more light, but you can see all the little branchlets that are coming off of these long branches. And then whatever happened here, super duper fascinating though. Um, I'm loving watching it grow. I'm glad that it finally seems to have adjusted and stopped dropping clades. That was kind of obnoxious for a while. But it's one of the just difficult things about being in sphagnum moss. It's repotting a change in environment. Some plants don't adapt well to that. And I am actually really surprised, though, because if that, like I said, if that is Ripsalis jungeri, it's amazing how much better 
this has done than the ones that I got um, from Europe. So that's really, really interesting. And then you just want to show this guy because of how much and how beautiful it's growing and it's clades and everything. So this one was supposed to be Ripsalis cuneata. And I don't know if it's Ripsalis cuneata, but I am just kind of loving, loving it just in general. It's just beautiful. I love this clade. I don't know what it is about that clade, but you can also see here all of the new clades coming off of this old clade. So this plant is growing really fast. Despite having had it for a while um, and having it outside and everything, it was not really growing very fast. So I definitely think that this, what they say about it, a lot of the things that I've read about it, wanting to be like a higher humidity kind of thing, if it is Cuneata, definitely wanted to have higher humidity than I think it was getting at any other time that I've had it. So it seems to like the warmth and humidity in the cabinet. I suppose I should show this. I actually just was just going to bypass the fact that these buds on my Dendrobium spectabile, uh, they it very much seems like they're going to make it. I am I was waiting, just waiting so impatiently for those to open. I've had that for so many years, guys. And I've just been like, it's never going to bloom, is it? But it just needed a cabinet. <laughs> and here we are in the other cabinet. And I wanted to show in here just how much the Ribsalis aureas are starting to grow. All of them everywhere. The ones in the cabinets, the ones downstairs, they're all just kind of exploding and growing everywhere. It's really fabulous. Wanted to take a quick look at this guy that I moved in here. <laughs> Um, so this was a different Ripsalis Bartholodii, and you can see all of the growth that's coming out after having been moved in the cabinet. Seems to just be loving life in the cabinet. And then here we see the other Ripsalis Jungeri. It is obviously hydrated. It's not all desiccated. It seems to be trying to survive. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that one. So very excited though because the other Ripsalis Bartholodii. This is just like so crazy because I think that this has just the most beautiful clades. They are so attractive. Look at how attractive they are. They're just beautiful. And it's so hard to describe like the general feeling of them. Like they're shiny, they're smooth, they're, they, they lose their shine with age, but generally they're shiny, they're smooth, they're kind of a little... They're thinner than a lot of the other flat clade types, but they still have kind of a succulence to them. They're just gorgeous. And I love that they have like these little pink or reddish sort of um, spines or hairs at the aerials. I just think that is so fabulous, but that is not what we're excited about. What we're excited about is that. We are excited about that it's going to be my first it's my first ever bud on this and so I'm so excited but one of the things that I want to point out about this bud or just in general I think is a lot of times we actually overlook the the flowering parts of the plants when we're looking for identifications so you see how short the ovary is on that bud I just want to point that out because on a lot of other species, like let's take, for example, Ripsalis gobeliana, the ovary on that is very long in comparison. It's an interesting identification factor. I don't know what's going on with this. I still don't know what it is, but I definitely think that that growth is very attractive. Um, we can look at the other Dismillus, the one that's not grafted in here. And you can see it's not really as fast, but you can also see that it is definitely growing. So it definitely has new growth, which I think is just exciting. I think so highly of this Ripsalis. It's, I, it's hard to describe, I think, because for most people, I think when they look at it, it's probably like not, it's in like such a baby state as like these small cuttings that it's kind of hard to picture what it's like when it's big and mature. But 
it's beautiful. <laughs> like it's beautiful and it has the most beautiful flowers and it's so weird. <laughs> I mean, I think that might be one of the reasons why I like it so much really is just because it's kind of so weird. It's so pretty in here, guys. Right now, the sun is shining because it's starting to kind of go into spring and Every time I see it do that, I'm just like, oh, it's so pretty. <laughs> I have a hard time leaving my bedroom these days <laughs> because there's so many interesting things to look at and it, it feels so like calming and therapeutic. I'm a bit of a mess in here right now. <laughs> so I'm a mess in here because it's watering time. And so right now it's Hoya watering time. So you can see all the Hoyas there now that I have cleared away the Hoya. What I wanted to look at down here is Phyphra Ascenta Potensis. Now, I am going to be honest about this. For as long as I have had this plant, I have sort of hated it. The branch is dying back. And then it got sunburnt last year, like really terribly. And so big parts of it were like dying and I took them off and had to replant them. And it's just never really grown very well. It's never done very well. It's never flowered very well. It's always like one of these things where it has just like one or two flowers every once in a while. And so last year I was excited because it was the first time that it ever actually kind of flowered. I think that one of the cool things about this is that I just really kind of didn't give up on this plant because it was always alive. It just wasn't growing very well. This year, I actually kept it upstairs in the house. I don't remember where it's been in previous years, to be honest. I think because a lot of times when a plant does not do well, I sort of try to block it out. It, for whatever mysterious reason, I think that because I was actually paying attention to it and keeping an eye on it and stuff and taking care of it, like really taking care of it, watering it consistently, making sure that it was fed with the hydroponic fertilizers every time I watered. It has actually done really well through the winter. It's a really beautiful plant. I mean, it is. I've seen other people grow it and have just like absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous plants. And so a lot of the growth that's on here, you can see like, whoa, there is a new little growth right there that is coming out and all year, like all winter, it's been doing that. This was a new branch right here. That's a new branch and actually the branch it's growing on was a new branch. So it's done a lot of producing lots of, this is, was a new branch. All of these right here, oh, I don't know if we can get up there. All of these branches that are coming off of this branch, they were all new branches through the winter time. All of these, like you can see up here, all of the growth, eh, the new growth that's coming off of that. From what I've noticed now of the way that I took care of this and the way that I was always watering it, like as soon as it was drying, making sure it was fully hydrated and making sure it was fertilized and stuff. I can definitively say like, oh geez, this plant actually really likes, it really likes to be hydrated. I never ever suspected that before. So I'm really excited that it's making this kind of comeback after like the horrible sun burning thing. This year, I'm definitely going to be much, much, much more careful when I move the plants outside. We have a quick look here at Hadiora salicornioides, form cylindrica. And you can see this one was grafted. This one was grafted on Perscariopsis. And I've had this one for a while, not too, too long. But these guys are all just kind of starting to come into bloom. I have several Hadiora salicornioides just the standard form and then cylindrica I have lots of them. Some of them are huge, some of them are small, some of them do better than others, some of them flower better than others, and they flower at different times too. Whoops. But they all typically kind of start right about now, and then they these guys will actually flower all the way into summertime. And so this just happened to be one of the very first ones to really really kind of produce some flowers, but always very attractive. It is, I mean, I have a lot of favorites, but this definitely has always been one of my very favorites. 
<laughs> so this looks so crazy right now. This I think has typically always been upstairs in the house through the winter. And this time I moved it downstairs. I moved all of the Schlumberger downstairs. There were two reasons. One is because they get spider mites. And then the other one is because I can actually water them effectively, where upstairs I was kind of struggling with that. It's humid, I can spray them, they definitely get watered. This guy right here gets watered a lot. It's something that I have definitely noticed about the Schlumbergera, like more Buckleyi types. What I guess we're really trying to say by that is Schlumbergera truncata that has been crossed with Schlumbergera russelliana. So they seem to just want more water in general than like your normal truncata hybrids. It's always kind of been one of my favorite plants. I think the reason why is because I got it locally. There's a gal that runs a shop here and she just had this old ancient one in the corner and I asked for cuttings and so I just grew this guy from some cuttings and you can see this. So this is the kind of growth that it was putting on when it was upstairs in the house. And it would just kind of be long and gangly, I guess. And so you can see it would still bloom and everything and it's still blooming. It's been blooming for quite a while, this plant. I love this plant's flowers. I actually just love sort of your ones that kind of pick up the Rosselliana genetics. I love the way that the flowers look. They're multi-toned, they're a lot more symmetrical. They're just more attractive in general, to me anyway. Um, but I want to show what has been happening to it now downstairs. So <laughs> this is kind of difficult. This is one of these things that's kind of difficult to show really. But all this, this stuff here, all this like frilly, frilly stuff that's at the ends here, that's all new growth. New growth over the winter time too, in a basement. So obviously my, my basement is way more like an actual greenhouse at this point, but it was just the benefit of this getting good light, lots of water, lots of airflow, and just not having spider mites through the winter time. You know, the spider mites had just been the absolute worst, worst thing. And getting fertilized regularly as well. You know, just with the consistent low doses of the hydroponic fertilizer, it just started doing very, very well. It's absolutely gorgeous. Hey, Emily. Hello. <laughs> She's like, I like the plant too, mom. All right. But yeah, they just... I mean, it's just fantastic and it makes you so excited and so happy when a plant just decides to, or like some of these plants like the Pfeiffera suntipotensis, you know, when it just starts doing what you want a plant to do, which is grow, grow a lot and grow beautifully. So this is definitely, I think, one of my serious wins over the winter and actually most of the Schlumbergera have been a serious win over the winter growing in the basement versus growing upstairs. I'm really excited to see the sky flower again. So this has flowered for me before, but only like one flower. So I'm excited to see more flowers coming out on this. And this would be Schlumbergera white bell variegated. This has become a little famous. We definitely have, I think the more famous one, the one that most people think of, which is the Schlumbergera Madam butterfly variegated. But this one kind of came on the scenes a little bit later. And this one is actually a truncata. It doesn't really have any Orishiana genetics in it, I don't think. This one has been used a lot in hybridizing in the last few years, I guess. And partially because it is throwing a lot of variegated offspring. And what is amazing about that is that where once variegated Schlumbergera that were extremely rare and anything else had to be very strongly questioned as whether or not it was even legit. Now we have a lot of them and 
that is mostly thanks to this guy. Its offspring obviously are naturally variegated. They aren't a spontaneous mutation like this one would have been. I have a couple of the little offspring. I think that they're just really cool and I'm just seeing them more and more and more. I wouldn't say that the flowers on this are really all that remarkable. This would be grown, I think, mainly for the plant. The variegation on this plant, it can be kind of hit or miss to me anyway. Some some of the variegation, like this clade right here, I think this is very attractive variegation. You can see that it's like multi-toned, kind of layered. It's really pretty, but sometimes the variegation on this is just kind of like that right there, where it's just kind of weird and mottled and not not really my cup of tea. Or like this right here. I like the layering. So like Madam Butterfly's variegation I think is absolutely gorgeous. This one's kind of patchy. I really do like white truncata flowers, but I also think that this plant having white flowers and being variegated is kind of striking. But I think that for most people, not all people, just most people, the white flowers are going to be kind of unremarkable and they will be growing it specifically for the plant. I've also heard a lot of complaints about this being very difficult to grow. I have not really experienced that and I'm not really sure why. I have a theory that sometimes the reason why some things are easier for me to grow where they seem like they're harder for, for other people is because I, I live in a cool place. And so maybe it's just something about this guy likes cool temperatures or something. I don't really know. But nice to see it blooming again. Happy to see it growing. Happy to see it blooming. Happy to see it really doing anything. And I just figured we'd take a look at this gorgeous Ripsalis aurea. This is one of the ones from downstairs. And I said that they were all kind of growing. And I just wanted to show like how massively some of them started to grow. Just a wonderful, wonderful Ripsalis. I just do not think I have ever seen a Ripsalis grow this quickly. It's so active. Um, this is another one where people, I think, have had complaints about it being kind of difficult. One of the things that I've noticed about it is that it definitely, it definitely likes water. It's definitely one that I do not really let dry out too much. If you let it dry out, it will actually sort of die back uh, the branches at the base. And you can see that these are, and it's kind of unsightly to you when it dies back. This guy has a strong tendency to die back and the branches, see how they're black. Now, those are fine. You can see that the rest of the branch is still alive and it's still fine. But sometimes that happens and the whole branch just kind of dies. It's got a little bit of a thing where it tends to kind of produce little black little black tips and stuff. And oh my gosh, there are buds and I didn't even see them. Crazy town. There are some weird little buds going right here. You know how alien and weird <laughs> that looks? Like, see the little tiny buds, the little yellow buds peeking out there? The little buds... But look at that weird little bud. Like, why is that trying to produce a bud off of brand new growth like that in such a weird way? Crazy. I didn't even see it. And that's the only place that I see on this plant right now that has any buds. I should, ch I should check the other one downstairs. They have just brought me so much happiness, just in general. I think from the moment that I got it, like, well, not from the moment, from the moment that I got it, immediately I had like some issues where I think little parts of it kind of died. But then once it rooted, it, it has brought me legitimately just nothing but happiness after that. It, it has, it flowered super fast. It started growing super fast. I've never seen any, any Ripsalis species really grow so much so quickly and so beautifully. I love the way this plant looks. And on top of that, having these beautiful bell-shaped yellow flowers, it's just a fabulous, fabulous Ripsalis. Just, it's absolutely remarkable, wonderful Ripsalis. So here is a Ripsalis that everyone knows and loves. 
And this would be Ripsalis pachecoleonis, subspecies Cadnulata. Most people get the name of this one wrong and call it Paradoxa minor. Has these little tiny chains, I guess chains in the branches, and depending on light, these can get more or less, like here's, that probably grew in very high light. The chaining is very tight. Also higher light, very tight chaining. And in my case, because at points this was grown in lower light, it might get etiolated. The chaining might be elongated like that. It is actually kind of a higher light Ripsalis. A lot more light than I was accustomed to thinking about in terms of Ripsalis. So even when the Ripsalis go outside, I put it in a higher light place than most of the other ones. The reason why we're looking at this is not because I want to feature this. Although it's beautiful and it, you know, it's grown a little bit over the winter, this is not a species that I think had done very well for me in the past. It's kind of a slow grower. And I think that it's beautiful, but it also needs so much light. And I think that in the beginning, I didn't realize that it was a higher light Ripsalis and so didn't do as good as it should have done. The one that we're going to look at is actually Ripsalis pachecoleonis, subspecies pachecoleonis. And we're going to look at two different ones because one of the strange things about Ripsalis pachecoleonis, subspecies pachecoleonis, is that it was described as having two different sort of berry colors. I had initially purchased this plant, this labeled as Ripsalis dismillis form dismillis. Every time I had it or every time I got it, it always had this kind of odd appearance to it, like messy. This right here is sunburn. It was another plant that got sunburnt. So you can see it's got the scarring, all of the corking and stuff there. It had this growth like this, which, was like very, very faintly sort of angled, but very faintly. And then it always had this kind of funky caterpillary type growth on it. And Ripsalis pachecoleonis, subspecies pachecoleonis, was described this way. When I realized the sort of higher light requirements about Ripsalis pachecoleonis, subspecies cadenulata, I put this plant in higher light. And when I put it in higher light, the chaining became more prominent on this plant. It will still not have anywhere near the same density of chaining as Ripsalis pachecoleonis subspecies cadenulata. You can see the chaining here just because it was grown in very strong light. You can even see as the new growth comes out, how strongly they resemble each other. These will eventually fall down Right now, the way that it's growing, it has a very strong grow light just above it. And so all this growth is in response to like shooting straight up towards that grow light. But I also think that to some degree that growth is normal. You will occasionally see this kind of caterpillary growth on Ripsalis pachecoleonis subspecies cadenolata, but not anywhere near the same amount that will come out on this one. And you can see even here in highlight, it's the ends of the growth, you can see it's kind of got that little bit, you know, a little bit of fur being downstairs and having that really strong grow light. It's just done really well and produced all this crazy growth that's sticking straight up like that. That growth didn't start outside. All of that came in downstairs in the basement. This is the one that has the white berries. This is also Ripsalis pachecoleonis subspecies pachecoleonis. This is the one that has the red berries and the flower on this one is also considerably more pink. And the higher light you put it in, the pinker it will get. And its branches will tinge sort of like the reddish color. It's just a clone that happens to have more betalins, which is why it's going to get kind of purpley. This guy is definitely screaming for more light than where it's at in the basement. So again, you get like this kind of thinner growth. It should be like quite thick. And the chaining, the chaining is there, but it's really not so prominent. But the higher light you get this in, the more and more prominent that will get. But here you can see this beautiful little flower and some buds. He just sort of sporadically blooms whenever he feels like it. 
I feel like that's true for subspecies Pacheco leonis and subspecies Cadnulata. They just sort of bloom whenever they feel like it. Like subspecies Cadnulata ninja bloomed when I brought it inside in the fall. I didn't even see that it was blooming and it had blooms on like the opposite side of the plant. And by the time I saw them, I was like, oh, hey, what the heck? But this little branch right here, the one that it's blooming off of was very close to the, like a really strong grow light. It was growing toward it, like where the other ones not, they weren't necessarily. So that's probably why this is flowering. And you can see they're just very, very small, small flowers. These are not very big, it, like in comparison to Ripsalis dismillis, which has huge flowers. Like here, if we were to measure this flower, it's very small, it's very dainty. There you go. So it's about 8.61 millimeters. So that's like 0.8 centimeters, 0.85 approximately centimeters. Not a very big flower. It's very attractive though. I actually read something that was kind of interesting recently. Um, I think they may have, or I think it may have been proposed to create another subgenus of Ripsalis and that Ripsalis pacheco leonis, subspecies pacheco leonis and subspecies cadnulata would be moved into it along with Ripsalis lindbergiana. And I think there was one more, but I'm drawing a blank on what it is. I will find the paper and actually put like a notation about about what it was. And I thought that was really interesting because they all have these very similar little flowers like this. These small, about five petals, rotate. You can see the little ovaries. I thought that was just really interesting. I think that subspecies Cadnulata, the flowers are kind of a little, I don't even know how to describe that. They're like a little yellow, a little pink, it's kind of peach, but they're kind of mostly white. And sometimes they can be like a little bit brownish. Now, the other one that I have, the other subspecies, Pacheco leonis, that one has flowers that are almost entirely white with the smallest, smallest hint of pink. So when you look at these, you can actually see that the pink is kind of more of like a, a mid-stripe there. When you look at the other one, you can very, very faintly make out a little tiny pink midstripe, but it is nowhere near this pink. And again, that's just down to the Bedouins, but very attractive. These were a couple of cuttings that I got that I imported from Europe. I was so excited to get this. It needs to be under much, much stronger light. It was kind of a sad thing to me about this group salad. It being so prolifically mislabeled in the United States, it made it really, really hard to get. It's a struggle because there are very old plates that say that it's Ripsalis dismillis, but then like later on, and if you hadn't read everything, you wouldn't know that later on, they were like, oh no, they were looking at the wrong plant. So Ripsalis pacheco leonis, subspecies pacheco leonis, and Ripsalis dismillis form dismillis, they superficially resemble each other. And that is kind of how that happened. Rupsalis pachanco leonis, subspecies cadnulata. And then next to it, we have Rupsalis pachanco leonis, subspecies pachanco leonis, the one with white berries and more white flowers. And then next to that, we have Rupsalis pachanco leonis, subspecies pachanco leonis, the one with the pink flowers and red berries. And then next to that, we have Rupsalis dismillis form dismillis. And you can see that these two plants do kind of resemble each other, which is how the mistake was made in the first place and how we ended up with like a plate that unfortunately had a drawing of this species under the name Ripsalis dismillis form dismillis. But that has since been corrected. I think that the telltale sign that that's not true is actually just in the flowers. <laughs> So obviously these two species have wildly different flowers and the flower of Ripsalis pacheco leonis, subspecies pacheco leonis, looks very, very similar to the flower of Ripsalis pacheco leonis, subspecies cadnulata, which it definitely should. I hope you've enjoyed looking at these things with me. Thank you for watching and as always, happy cacti growing.